Hi, everyone. We've set up this Being an Engineer podcast as an industry knowledge repository, if you will. We hope it'll be a tool where engineers can learn about and connect with other companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. So make some connections and enjoy the show. And with each project, you develop a new skill instead of being like, okay, let me practice cutting a whole bunch of straight lines. Uh, That's not quite as rewarding. And it's it's honestly, I think it's harder to learn that way because you don't really get the application. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. We are co-host Rafael Testai. Today, we have another very special guest, Jared Geddes. Jared is a Boeing engineer by day and a YouTube woodworker by night. He has been a manufacturing engineer and a mechanical engineer and loves a good design. He uses his engineering background to design and build wooden furniture, structures, and toys, which he shares on his YouTube channel, The Evening Woodworker. Jared, welcome to the show. Hi, Raphael. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I came across your channel on YouTube. You have almost 40,000 followers, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it just crossed the 40,000 threshold. So congratulations. And I am actually interested in getting into woodworking. And I, what advice would you give to a mechanical engineer who has gone to school for mechanical engineering it's either almost finishing up or already finished. So he or she knows all the th- theoretical knowledge, the physics, the calculus, but and also knows CAD, SOLIDWORKS, but they don't have a ton of experience when it comes to woodworking and they, they want to get into it. What advice, other than obviously just uh, sharing with people to get started, just start, what specific advice would you have for people in that circumstance that could optimize their learning curve when it comes to woodworking? Well, I would say, you know, one of the best things you can do as an engineer, especially once you get the theoretical and the CAD knowledge, is to get your hands dirty. Um, You know, get out there in the shop and go get a drill and, you know, maybe a circular saw and and just start building stuff. I mean, start with stuff that's simple um, and and then you just build and each project adds a new skill and adds something new. But I look around my house. And I try to figure out what do I need to, what would solve a problem that I have? Uh, So, you know, you may need a stool in a certain area because you've got a high cupboard that you've got to reach up to, or, you know, you have a a certain spot you'd like to have a table or, uh, you know, different things around the house, shelves and things like that. And you start with something simple. And, and there's plenty of advice on YouTube, plenty of people that, have videos and, and stuff showing how to do just basic projects. And then each project just adds and builds on top of that. And you buy more tools with each project and it's really fun. That's good advice. Get, get your hands dirty, get started. One of the things that I've found about online classes, like I'm a big fan of maybe masterclass.com. And I found that the content to learn a skill can be found online. But the, the classes charge because they curate the content for us. They put it in a sequence that a beginner can pick up and gradually go from easy to harder. And that would be my challenge. If I'm looking on YouTube, like you said, I wouldn't know what sequence to follow. How, how do I go about get started into, from the easier projects to the harder projects? Uh, what would you recommend for someone like me? Yeah, I mean, you could start by doing a course. Uh, honestly, like for me, I'm kind of a... I'm like a go figure things out kind of a person. And I think a lot of us in engineering, like one of the keys of an engineering education, I think is learning how to problem solve and how to approach a problem. Um, so when you're building something physically, especially with wood, uh, if you look at it from the big picture of here's my finished project, here's what I want, here's my vision and then break it down into the individual steps and be like, okay, these two boards need to be attached together. How am I going to do that? And then you can also look online and just look for examples of other people that have done something similar to try to get the ball rolling and get ideas. But I would look at it from a project by project standpoint 
And with each project, you develop a new skill instead of being like, okay, let me practice cutting a whole bunch of straight lines. Uh, that's not quite as rewarding. And it's, it's honestly, I think it's harder to learn that way because you don't really get the application. That's excellent. <clears throat> Uh, I think that may just be the quote for the podcast, doing it on a project by project basis. And that's that's excellent advice. When did you get started in woodworking? How old were you? Well, when I started, I was, well, officially, my first woodworking class was seventh grade woodshop. And before that, it was more of my dad had a drill and it was a corded drill, you know, so there's no break. So it just kind of, you know, drills a hole and then coasts down. And you, if you're trying to put a screw in with that, it'll just strip out the screw every time. Uh, but I did, as I was growing up, we made Christmas presents for each other, my, my brothers and sisters growing up. So that was one of the rules of our family growing up was for Christmas, you had to make the present for somebody else in your, for the other brothers and sisters. You couldn't just go buy something. And that was a fun thing that my parents did that really forced us to be creative and to try to make things and kind of forced us to be makers before maker was a thing. Um, and so that was where it all started. And I remember making like a shelf for my sister one year and a nightstand for the other sister. And then with that, I became interested in building things with wood. Then I took seventh grade wood shop and figured out how to actually cut a straight line and what a table saw was. And I was like, I can make straight lines and cut stuff in wood shop, but I can't get a straight line at home. And it was because our method growing up was to draw a line on a board and then just try to eyeball your circular saw and just try to hit the line. And when you're trying to just do it like that, it makes it very difficult to get a good straight line. So, um, I learned some of the skills in seventh and eighth grade woodshop. And then throughout high school, I took some more shop classes um, and ended up doing a senior project of building a display cabinet that I designed and then built. So that's where it all started. What a beautiful Christmas tradition. <clears throat> Christmas is my favorite day of the year. And what, what a beautiful thing that your parents had started. What, was it their idea or it was passed on from one of their parents? I think it was their idea. Um, they just really wanted to encourage us to be creative. And so it was a, a fun way to do it. And it may have been also a cost thing. They didn't want to go out and buy a bunch of stuff. You know, it was more of like, here, let's make some stuff out of felt. <laughs> you know, so my mom was a very good seamstress. And so any sewing projects, we would she would help with that. Um, so, and then later on when I was in high school, they continued kind of the same approach. And they said, I remember one time I wanted a desk in my room in high school. I wanted an L shaped desk in the corner. And they said, we're not going to go buy one, but we'll buy the materials if you want to build it. So I was like, Oh, okay. Well, let me, let me try this out. That is so cool. And uh, by any chance, have you, do you have your own family now or no? I do. I actually have four boys. And another something, another baby on the way. Fantastic. <laughs> I don't know yet what it is. Congratulations. So is this something that you, you, you've started in your own Christmases? Are you planning on? Yes. Yes. We were doing this with our kids as well. It was a great way to get me introduced to creativity at a young age. So, yeah, we're trying to do it. It does take more effort from the parents at the younger ages. But then once the kids kind of catch the vision, then they start to pick it up themselves. What a coincidence. You know, I just got married this week and I've been thinking about what traditions I want to start in my family because it's, it's an opportunity. And now that you mentioned this on this podcast, it may just change the rest of my life. Um, we may actually just pick <laughs> up on those. It's, it's wonderful. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we actually just posted all the pictures on social yesterday. I'm getting all the messages. I have family in Argentina. So it's wonderful. Um, so g give me some advice. If I actually, I'm serious about starting this in my family, of course, what, what would be like the, the, the age that the kids can get started participating in this? Um, I would say, so when your kids start doing art and drawing stuff, that's usually actually one of the things that they start at a very young age and they start 
developing kind of the skills of being able to draw a picture and they, the more they can connect a circle correctly or the more they can draw something that actually looks like a person, you know, stick figures and things like that. That's when their, their brain is developing. It's a, if, once they start doing those creative things, if they just learn to give gifts of drawing a picture for somebody that starts it. And so you can start it very early. I mean, in preschool, if you want, um, it's just really the parents have to be like, you have to be on top of it and be like, okay, what do you want to make for this person? Or what do you want to make for your mom? Um, and, and that's just, you know, it just becomes a tradition. That's so amazing. the earlier, the better. Is this something that only the kids partake in or the spouses can gift each other things that they make? Yeah, for sure. Um, I usually will try to make something for my wife. Uh, she has a lot of stuff that I've made and some years have been more successful than others because sometimes I'm just trying to guess on something she would like. But um, it's something that I've continued doing uh, that I just, I like. And so I'm going to, it's a fun tradition and it's, it's kind of up to the the couple if, if you decide to do it for each other. Um, but you can, it doesn't also have to be something out of wood. You know, it could be if you have another creative medium that you like to use, uh, that could be another thing, a way that you could gift to each other. But it just, to me, it makes the gifts much more meaningful and Absolutely. much more heartfelt. Can, can it be like a digital gift that you made? Yeah. Yeah. I've done that some years. Um, one year I made, well, for an anniversary, I did a, uh, it was kind of a, a map of where we had met and kind of showed some, I did a, a stylized map of kind of, here's the location with a little pin, like here's the location exactly where we met, however many years ago it was. Um, and and so you can do stuff like that. How, too. how many it's years just, ago? I'm going to put you on the spot. So we have been married, married in 2008. So 13 years are coming up on, let's see, it's 2022. Yeah, coming up on 14 years. Right on. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me ask you about this. Now, I'm sure if I'm so interested in this, I'm sure there's got to be at least a couple of listeners following along and still interested in this, in this concept, in this tradition, I want to know the surprise factor is part of Christmas. The other party, the receiving party is surprised when they receive the gift. Is it different when you create something for them? Do you actually have a conversation with them? Like, Hey, what would you like for me to make you? Or is it a complete surprise? Sometimes it'll be, there'll be a need, but one of the fun things I think is to the surprise. Like for me, when I was in high school, again, it was more, I had much more fun giving the gifts that I had made to my siblings than I did receiving any of the other ones it, because it was so much effort that I had put into it and so much love and care. And so it was just kind of this moment of seeing their reaction was just made it all worth it. And in the week before Christmas at our house growing up and now as well at my house now, um, the week before Christmas was always just like, I mean, Santa's workshop. It was <laughs> Everybody was, we had, I remember growing up, we had little like cardboard walls we would put up and we'd watch a Christmas movie together, but everyone would be behind their cardboard wall that was low. And then you'd be working on something and say, don't look over here on our side and <laughs> keep, keep the wall up. <laughs> so it was fun. Very cool. So switching gears, I see that you do design for manufacturing. Can you tech, talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so this is this kind of goes to um, the back to from the beginning of you know any engineering project or any design project, uh, you have to really make sure that you understand the whole process of what's going to happen um, from the concept and the requirements at the beginning through the design phase and the manufacturing phase. Um, one of the things that a lot of designers forget, a lot of engineers forget is, you know, everything looks great on the model. Everything looks great in CAD. And then you send it out to get manufactured and they say, you know, we can't physically do that. <laughs> like, you know, there's, I, I, I had a, a friend 
that had done a design on something that had a, a pin that was captive. So there was no physically physical way to get the pin in and out. It had, he designed it in place and completely forgot about the access. And so once we realized that was an issue on his design um, and we fixed it, then he took that drawing of the old one and he put it up on his wall at his desk to remind him to design for manufacturing. Uh, and it was just a great example of, yeah, you really have to think about the whole process. Now, talk to us a little bit more. How do you design for manufacturing? Is there like a checklist that you go through at the very end of your design or you're thinking about it as you're designing? Yeah, I think it's definitely a mindset. And and a lot of it comes from um, being familiar with, well, getting your hands dirty again. It's You have to be familiar with how a mill works, how a lathe works, uh, how you know somebody is going to be assembling it. So as you're building it, you're thinking, okay, could I fit an end mill in this area to machine out this corner? Uh, is this a super, super deep corner that I would need like a two foot long end mill to cut out? Is this going to be very difficult or expensive? Uh, so it's through the whole process. You have to just be familiar enough with the shop floor and with the manufacturing processes that when you do your design, that's just part of how you're thinking about the whole thing. Uh, that makes perfect sense, as I expected. All right, so now I'm going to take a quick break to mention that TeamPipeline.us is where you can learn more about how we can help medical device and other product engineering or manufacturing teams develop turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines to characterize, inspect, assemble, manufacture, and perform verification testing on your devices. I also want to give a, let our listeners know that we need your help getting to 100 podcast reviews. We're sitting at 30 right now. We have a long way to go. And we want to award you a $50 Amazon gift card, put you in a raffle. Once you uh, leave us a review and send a screenshot of your five-star review to podcast at teampipeline.us. You'll be put in a raffle that we will conduct at the end of the first quarter in 2022. So back to the podcast, speaking here with Jared. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about Boeing and what, what do you do over there? Yeah, so at Boeing, I work on one of the defense programs. Um, I'm a design engineering lead on the P-8A program, which is uh, an airplane that's a 737 platform that has been militarized and turned into a submarine hunter. So imagine your typical 737 Southwest Airlines size. Um, we took that and, and put a torpedo bay on the bottom and, you know, put weapons on the wings and it can hunt for submarines, can do a lot of naval surveillance. So my responsibility there is I'm the design lead of the interiors payloads team. So any of the uh, stuff that the crew interacts with inside the tube of the airplane, that's what my team's responsible for. Beautiful. So I guess you do that nine to five and then you do the woodworking in the evenings, right? Yep. That's, that's my routine. It's the engineer by day, woodworker by night. Okay. And what are you doing your weekends? Weekends as usually soccer games and uh, baseball. And, and then I usually try to squeeze in maybe an hour or two of woodworking if I can. So cool. that's, that's more family time on the weekends. Who, who helps you with the video editing? I do that also myself. Okay. Uh, how did you think about starting a YouTube channel? A lot of people just keep to themselves. And how did that cross your mind? So one of the things that I did in high school and I kind of discovered was video editing. We had to do a project in chemistry class about um, some chemical reaction. And I thought, well, what about combustion? That sounds like something fun you know, blowing things up. So I got a bunch of video clips from movies about things blowing up and <laughs> put it all in the, you know, my, my final project. And I was like, this is super fun. <laughs> and I just kind of got hooked at that point and, and the creative juices were flowing. So I always knew that I enjoyed making video and doing video editing. And then eventually when I got, my own house and my own shop 
and my family. Then I was doing woodworking and building stuff. And I said, you know, I've always liked doing video as well. And I saw some videos on various woodworking channels that were not particularly difficult or were people just talking, you know, in a, you know, not really, it just didn't look like it was that, that hard to do. And so I was like, well, maybe I should start a YouTube channel and then I can do video editing and woodworking. And someday maybe I can make some money off it. So that was where it all started. And then I've just enjoyed doing it ever since. So I like the story aspect of the editing, telling the story of whatever it is you're building. And then also the building of it um, is also the enjoyable part as well. Talk, talk to us a little bit more about the money-making aspect. Are you able to monetize on this woodworking hobby and how? Yeah, it's been really fun because not very many hobbies are self-sustaining. And I have been able to, you know, I get YouTube revenue from the ads and things like that. But I've also realized that a lot of people are very interested in the plans. And so I started making plans of projects that I had made and I have my website where I sell those plans. And for me, half of the fun of woodworking. By plans? Is it like drawings? Oh yeah. Yeah. So the plans are like, I'll do a, a 2d drawing of different views and dimensions and everything, just like an engineering drawing. And then right. I usually have a 3d model that I have as part of that. And then the build sequence. Oh, so, so what you do is you basically set, sell the, and also like an exploitive view, I imagine, right? Yeah, there's yeah, it's whatever views. Because I mean, with the engineering background, I know how to do drawings. I know how to I know how to communicate technical information. Um, so it's a way to do that that hopefully is understandable to the people that are wanting to build things. I see. So you're telling me you're selling those uh, the drawings, basically uh, the PDFs, right? Yeah. Right. And how, how much can uh, one expect to buy those PDFs? Obviously, depending on the project, but what would be the ranges? Yeah. So I have for the individual plans, it's anywhere from $5 is the cheapest up to, I think, 15 at this point. And then I have like a package that has a bunch of them together for 30 or 29. Um, and it's something that, like I was saying, I, for me, Half of the fun of woodworking is designing the stuff too. So I like to do the design and the actual woodworking of making it. And so I never, very seldom do I use plans, but there's a lot of people out there that don't have an engineering background that don't necessarily, uh, or can't think in terms of, uh, you know, all the details of the designs. And so I realized, wow, there's people would want to pay money for this because then they can build their own. So that's when I started reverse engineering my own designs and turning them into official plans. And it's been really good. This is very cool. So I'm, uh, I can find access to these PDFs on your website, eveningwoodworker.com. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I if you go there. Plans. Yep. Under plans. I see that. Yeah. This is very affordable. $10 for a plan. 15, 10, yeah, it's, it's the price range you mentioned. You did a pulley crank. Beefy bunk bed. For anyone with kids, this one's for you. Okay. I'm ex well, this is really interesting. Uh, the, the way that you thought about this, the way they monetize this. So what can the user expect? Because I clicked on the beefy bunk bed. Quantity one, $10. I pay with PayPal. And what happens after that? So after that, you'll get an email once everything goes through you'll get an email that is the digital download and it's a zip file <laughs> that contains the 2d drawings it contains uh, the 3d model with sketchup is the software that i use for that and then the third thing is the build sequence which is kind of the step-by-step -step, do this first do this first and so i've kind of combined my design side and my manufacturing engineering side and I have both of those there. There's the manufacturing plan, there's the drawing, um, and the model. So both of those come. And with most of my plans at this point, the ones that I have released are 
they kind of assume a base knowledge of how to use the tools, like how to cut something with a table saw. So at some point in the future, I may try to focus more on like a beginner level uh, plans, but that, that is one thing that, you know, if somebody has never used any tools before, then there's some assumption of a base knowledge in the plans that I have. I see. And if I may ask, how do you get your website? Because a lot of mechanical engineers listening, uh, sometimes we don't have all the all the knowledge and everything. We know mechanical engineering, and that's our thing sometimes. But how did you get the website to automate this send of the PDF? I imagine you don't do that manually, do you? No, and that was that's part of it. Like with because this woodworking stuff is my side gig, I I want to try to the the goal was to kind of set up passive income and so youtube obviously you have to make videos regularly it's not something that is uh but it's not something that i have to be actively on the platform for people to be able to uh, watch it so that's a way i can make passive income the plans are another way to make passive income and that was part of it is i didn't want to have to manually send something get an email that says you have an order now send this so it's all incorporated through, I think I use Wix um, for my website hosting. And there's other ones, Squarespace and all of those. Most of them have something built in. They have many apps within the website developer that is um, a commerce app or something where it connects through PayPal. Um, so there's those, um, there's like various apps to do various parts of the website. And I've been, I've been pretty happy with mine. Um, it, it's, it's very small scale. You know, it's not a, a huge massive website, but, but it does what I need. And it's great because when it's working, you know, when it's up and live and everything, I just get notifications on my phone that says somebody bought your plans. How does that feel when you get that little notification? Oh, oh it's awesome. Especially when I'm on vacation. Right? You want to tell your <laughs> yeah, wife, like, like, hey, babe, look, we're making money on the beach right now. <laughs> right. We just made 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's something. Face for a drink or something. That's cool. That's right. <laughs> so I'm looking at SketchUp, and I've never heard of it. Like, I use SolarWorks. Uh, I heard Fusion 360, Rhino. So SketchUp is like a 3D design CAD system? Yeah. Yeah. So SketchUp is one that was originally created by Google, and it has – there's a lot of woodworkers that have started using SketchUp. And one of the things that's nice about it is it has a very low bar for entry in terms of if you've never used a 3D modeling software before, it's very intuitive. Um, in SolidWorks and like in, in my work, we use Katia. Uh, but in, in those ones, there's you have to understand a lot more about how 3D modeling works and how you extrude things. And how to, you know, add thickness to stuff and create planes and surfaces. Um, in SketchUp, it's more of like draw a box, stretch the box to this shape, you know, push up this side. <laughs> and so it's it's a very powerful program, but it's set up in a way that is um, just intuitive. So I I let, jumped onto that one because initially it was it was a free one. And I think they still have a free version online that actually can do a fair amount. Um, but it's it's one that's in my niche in the woodworking community. It is something that is it's very common. I see. Well, coming here to an end, I want to ask you about humanitarian engineering. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I did when I was in college was – we had the opportunity to do to work with a group called engineers without borders and did some projects where we were doing engineering in countries, other countries and areas, developing nations, developing communities um, to try to help them improve their standard of living. And one of the things that we discovered there was the importance of, of making sure you really understand the customer and the end user of the projects. Uh, we had some projects. I, I did one in 
in Tonga where we were making biodiesel out of coconut oil. And so we had a, a class at school um, where we would we would figure out what the issue was and then try to develop engineering solutions. And then at the end of the semester, we would go out to the location to Tonga and, and then go try to implement what we had come up with. And so we had contacts throughout the semester we'd be working with. But one of the things that was really important in that was to understand what the real needs were. You know, if you're trying to solve a problem that doesn't actually exist, that you, you miss the boat and whatever you, whatever you develop, doesn't ever really get used. And so we had examples of projects that were failures because we didn't really understand what the needs were of the people. It was more we're coming in and saying, this is what you need. You'll love it. It's great. You know, but they actually didn't need that. And then we had other ones where we went in and we did find what the actual need was. And then, you know, it was successful and they continued using it after we left. Well, that's that's great insights. I'm actually on the website right now, Engineer with Without Borders USA, and uh, does one have to be a student to volunteer? Uh, no, they have they have student chapters, and I think they have they have professional chapters as well. Uh, I haven't been able to do it as much as I've been out in the you know in the working world now, but it's definitely something that is. It's a great way to apply the things that you've learned to people that definitely need it. But it's something where you need to have, you need to really understand the communities where you're working in so that you can provide them the things that they need. That's beautiful. Well, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you in this podcast? Um, let's see. Well, I will say if you are an engineer and you want to get into woodworking, it is an awesome hobby to get your hands dirty, to get yourself working on things that are physical because there's a lot of, especially with structural engineering, any sort of structural knowledge or intuition that you may have, it's very translatable to woodworking, you know, because you have the weight of a piece of furniture, you have a load path where you have to transfer the load from the top of a bench down through the legs or through a cabinet or something. There's a lot of, a lot of, uh, application and engineering to woodworking. So it's, it's definitely one worth doing so that you can get involved. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And how can people find you? They can, well, I, I read every comment on my YouTube channel. So if you want to comment on one of the videos, that's one way to do it. I have uh, my email is up on my website. You can go to my website, eveningwoodworker.com, and um, you can send stuff through there. That's probably the best way. Well, Jared, I really appreciate being on the podcast, and thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.